the Mahabharata comprising nearly one lakh verses in 18 parbans or books and innumerable sub books is as per Indian tradition and Itihasa a true record of the legendary battle between two branches of the Kuru clan of North India, uh, the Kauravas and the Pandavas, as also the aftermath of the Great War. But both the South, East, uh, South Asian traditions of retelling episodes from the Mahabharata and the European scholarly tradition have largely and most unjustifiably neglected the final books of the great epic, underrating the high emotion, mythological complexities, and conflicted characters that animate these books. Mm -hmm. The books which tell a unified and self-bounded stories of their own, feels Wendy Doniger. Hi, everyone. I'm H. Purnima. Professor in Sanskrit, welcoming you all to the Kerala Literary Festival 2023, as part of which I have the privilege of conversing with the inimitable Dr. Wendy Doniger um, as one of her, uh, uh, on one of her recent works on translation, um, After the War, The Last Books of the Mahabharata. Dr. Doniger is a renowned Sanskrit scholar and Indologist, an acclaimed author of more than 40 books, who is currently a Mircha Eliade Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago. She has a double doctorate, one each from the Harvard University and the Oxford. Her career spans over five decades, during which time she has also taught at the School of Oriental and African Studies, uh, University of London and the University of California, Berkeley. Her interests include inter alia, music, dance, and of course, literature and horses. So let's have straight from the horse's mouth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, about her, your tryst with Sanskrit and India, madam. So could you please uh, brief us, Professor, uh, how this uh, uh, fantastic and fascinating journey of yours actually started? Oh, that's a long story. Thank you, Purnima, for, for that lovely introduction. Um, I, I actually published earlier this year um, with Speaking Tiger in Delhi, a book called An American Girl in India, Letters from 1962 to oh, 1963, which is where it began in India. That was my first trip to India um, when I was 22 years old, and I wrote a lot of letters home to my parents. And they, my mother my mother saves everything. My mother saved my, pet, my letters, and so I finally published the letters with some commentary. So that's how I first came to India. I first became interested in India much earlier. Again, it was my mother who gave me books to read about India. And then in high school, I loved Latin, and my Latin teacher taught me Greek. And she said, you'd really probably love Sanskrit. And I loved ancient India. I read a passage to India, E.M. Forster, and I read some translations of the Upanishads. Um, I now realize it was a terrible translation, but I thought it was great at the time. So by the time I was 17 and I went to Harvard, to Radcliffe, I majored in Sanskrit as a 17-year-old. That was that's what I wanted to study. And I studied with a wonderful professor, Daniel Ingalls at Harvard. And I never looked back. I never regretted it. I never really was as interested in anything else ever as I was in, in Sanskrit. And gradually I found that I really didn't like philosophy or kavya. They were too... Philosophy was too abstract for me, and Kavya was too fussy for me. I have actually a lowbrow mentality and a peasant mentality. And I like the Puranas, and I like the Mahabharata uh, even more than I like the Ramayana, or the Adi Kavya okay. Ramayana. No, I wanted the Itihasa. <coughs> <laughs> so I, right from the start, um, even as a young girl, I always liked 
shlokas. I like the simple meter of the Puranas and the epics. Um, and so I've, I've never stopped. I mean, I'm a rather boring person. I did that for 50 years. <laughs> I kept finding more and more things that interested me. So dreams, sexuality, or the, the dishonesty of the gods, or the explanation for evil. And always I kept coming back to the Mahabharata because even when you're doing Puranas and later Indian Sanskrit literature, it all starts in the Mahabharata. In some ways, of course, it all starts in the Rig Veda. And the Mahabharata thinks of itself as Vedic in a way. So there's a there's an unbroken line right there. But the point at which I was happiest to enter that line was at the Mahabharata. So I've been reading the Mahabharata since I was in college. And um, several books of the Mahabharata have been very well translated. There was a project from my own university, the University of Chicago, which translated the first five or six volumes. Then they ran out of money and they, they haven't gone on with it. Um, but no one really paid much attention to the last books because there are no battles and there's not a lot of philosophy. Um, there are not that many stories told in it the way they are all through the Shanti Parwan, the Anushasana Parwan, so many stories. <coughs> Sorry about the story. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so there aren't that many um, stories or philosoph philosophical texts. But the end of the Mahabharata is really quite wonderful because everything has been destroyed, everything has been lost. It's supposed to be a great victory. But they're miserable. Everybody that they love has been killed. They are full of guilt because even the good guys have committed sins all along the way, violated the Kshatriya ethic, killed illegally. Um, the whole war was a mistake. The women mourn their dead. And finally, in those last books, the, the philosophy turns around a little bit and starts thinking of what happens after death and what's going to become of the heroes and their wives and children. And there's some wonderful images and stories, trips to hell, trips to heaven, trips back to hell, um, arguments with the gods in heaven, um, visions, earlier visions of the dead warriors in heaven coming out of a river and spending a night on earth with their wives and their mothers. So those last books of the Mahabharata have a great deal to say about karma, about death and rebirth, about war, a lot of bad things to say about war, a lot of anger against war. Um, Yudhishthira says, to hell with war, to hell with chakra ethics, none of it is worth it. He, he renounces it all. And then there's the wonderful story of the, the dog, karma who comes in the form of a dog and tests Yudhishthira. They're just wonderful stories. So it was a great pleasure to translate them. And that's what I did. Thank you, Mindy. So, uh, Dr. Doniger, actually, uh, uh, in all your writings, there is an underlying sense of humor. Uh, but as you, uh, okay, uh, as you say that you were not attracted basically with the philosophy, but with the stories uh, and the myriad characters and everything, but still, how do you, uh, I mean, how do you respond to all that grief? I mean, given your writing, like the way we visualize you. Uh, so how do you, as a person, respond to all that grief, that guilt, that repentance, you know, underlying the entire epic, like right from the beginning and that there's so many conflicts and evil, as you say. Uh, so how do you yeah. respond to this? Well, you're right, of course. Um, both that I, I do have a sense of humor and I put humor into my own writing when I can. But the Mahabharata is not a comedy. The Mahabharata is a tragedy. Um, it's, it's a it's, it's tragedy all through it. And the end, in a sense, is a tragedy, except the, the Mahabharata has a happy ending. Not on Earth. On Earth, mm -hmm. it's tragedy. But at the end, in those last books, people begin to turn their back on earth and to look for a larger metaphysical picture in which there is a great deal of joy. Um, the vision of heaven is one of joyous reunion because there is no more hatred. 
There's no more manyu. Manyu is such a wonderful word in Sanskrit. It means anger and pride, but it really means um, a warrior, or more precisely, a nobleman, a kshatriyas, a high-born man, and it's a male virtue, it's a macho virtue, a high-born male um, warrior's refusal to tolerate any insult. How dare you do that to me? How dare you do that to my wife? And so forth. So the idea is that if you're a real man, macho person, anything bad that is done to you or your family, you immediately um, perpetrate an act of violence that makes them sorry they ever did anything to you. That shows how good you are. So it means perpetual killing. Manyu means that if you're a man who's proud of yourself, you will never let any injury to you go by without doing an even worse injury to the other person, and that's the Mahabharata. Everything gets worse and worse and worse and worse. But in the last books of the Mahabharata, the ones that I like so much, they talk about Manyu, and they talk about how it's wrong, and they renounce it. And Indra says the difference between heaven and earth is really that there's no money in heaven. That when Yudhishthira comes to heaven and he sees Duryodhana there and he says, I'm not going to be in heaven with Duryodhana. He was so awful. He did this, he did that, he did this, he did that. And Indra says, way, way, ho, take it easy, Yudhishthira. There is no money here. Duryodhana did his job. You did your job. Now you're both in heaven. Just chill out. And so everything is okay. There they all are. It's like a magic vision of what Earth could be like if we didn't keep retaliating. And retaliating is an argument for what in, in Africa became known as truth and reconciliation. Forgiving your enemies despite the truly awful things that they have done to you. And that's the way it stops. And what a wise bit of philosophy that is and how we could use it here. It's an amazing ending that they all make friends. So, there's I guess no there's, closure. there's closure. It's not comedy. There are some funny scenes, but very few. But there is closure. Um, there's an end to it. Therefore, it's, it's, I would say it's not comic. It's joyous. It's a joyous ending to 18 big Sanskrit books of tragedy. Oh, it's a wonderful book. Everybody should read it. <laughs> uh, but, uh, talking of uh, Manyu, um, I think isn't that a rather uh, kind of construct? Like, uh, I don't, uh, I suppose, like nobody is born with Manyu. And in fact, the major characters of the Pandava characters, especially, like Yudhishthira, or uh, I mean, Yudhishthira. Uh, isn't, doesn't seem to be characterized with Manyu, basically. And Arjuna, as he he just doesn't want to fight um, his kith and kin and the revered Acharyas and Bhishma and all. So, but rather they are goaded. They are goaded to do, I mean, they are uh, in Krishna, the entire Bhagavad Gita, uh, like uh, the preaching of karma. And the karma, of course, uh, certainly seems to chase them and, uh, uh, you know, through and through, but uh, uh, it chases them. So here I have two questions. A, um, A is um, alongside what is preached in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, how would you, I mean, how, uh, uh, how would you, like Bhagavad Gita is an integral part of Mahabharata and that is, I mean, uh, the, uh, rather the focal point of most of the time. And uh, how would you uh, play this Vardarohana uh, Parvan alongside it? How would you see it? And uh, to um, talk, I mean, uh, as to this closure, like, um, uh, you know, in the first books of the Mahabharata, the, uh, like, uh, uh, no, no, in fact, the final books, uh, they seem to be haunted by the past. All the time they're haunted by the past, they're full of remorse. I mean, uh, Yudhishthira or Dhritarashtra or Kunti, I mean, they're full of remorse, regrets and grief uh, um, and whatnot. But yet, those who left in the battle, Duryodhana and the like, 
they never uh, got the time or the chance, the opportunity to repent uh, mm -hmm. for their misdeeds. Uh, so is it, is it uh, in a way um, also uh, what you call, what you may call the twist of time or that uh, the fact that the Kali Yuga is an incessant cycle which one has to go through uh, over and over again because um, uh, because with repentance, with remorse, with reconciliation, uh, the other, the, uh, the um, maybe, I don't know, the good or evil, I don't know, but the good characters, uh, they are able to forgive. Forgive and reconcile. Even Bhima reconciles ultimately after giving, after actually, even after the war, um, he torments Dhritarashtra for 15 years. <laughs> but uh, uh, finally, in the Ashramika when he reconciles. And I think there is a kind of closure uh, there itself, though only after Swarga Rohana, the real um, closure happens. Mm. Uh, but uh, the epic doesn't uh, um, actually uh, doesn't really depict the closure for Duryodhana and uh, Dushasana and uh, Shakuni and those people. Although they they are they they do seem to be in heaven, um, all in uh, good gaiety and uh, um, devoid of hostility. But then they merge with uh, Kali Yuga, uh, not with uh, when. So is it is it a continuous process that Kali Yuga has to come? It has to continue. There is never an end to all this torment or conflict. Well, but there is an end because Kali Yuga comes to an end. So, on the one hand, you asked a lot of good questions there. So let's start with the Gita. So uh, the Gita is a moment of interruption right before the main battle. And a lot of the Gita is about karma. Um, in the end, the idea that um, Arjuna must perform his Kshatriya karma in a way. And that actions have reactions. But Krishna, even in the Gita, preaches against karma. He preaches for nishkama karma. Nishkama karma. For doing your activity Action. without Detach. being emotionally engaged in it. And if you're not emotionally engaged in it, then you won't feel revenge, which is an emotion, which is karma. So even in the Gita, which is kind of a special piece, Krishna teaches against <clears throat> the eternal involvement in karma, the commitment that one act makes you commit another. And Krishna himself, in Book 16, one of the books I translated, watches the battle going on, the battle of, of the clubs, the, the Masao Yaparwan uh, battle, and he stands back and he says he's not going to do anything about it because he knows that it has to happen the way it has to happen. And since he knows how it has to happen, he's not going to do anything about it. Then he sees them kill his son. <laughs> then he sees them kill his sons, and he's yeah. overcome with Manyu, and he himself starts killing yes, people. More than that. Absolutely. So even the God who in the Gita says, don't get involved in karma, is himself vulnerable to Manu, to the particular emotion of Manu, and kills more people than anybody else in that form. So the only answer there is to end karma entirely. And the Mahabharata has two ways of doing that. One is to say that at the end of the life, everybody has to go to both heaven and hell for a while. And the counterintuitive statement is, if you've been mostly good, you go to hell, but only for a little while. And then you go to heaven for a long time. But if you've been it's mostly... A, it's a shot at heart. Right. It's a shot at heart. <laughs> but mostly bad, you go to heaven. You say, well, that doesn't make sense. Well, you're in heaven, but you know it's not going to last for very long. And then you, after a short time in heaven, if you've been mostly a bad person, <clears throat> you go to hell for a long time. So in a way, that is the end of karma. You burn it out in heaven, you burn it out in hell, and then you're free at last for something the Mahabharata does not tell us about. You're just free. So too the world works out its karma. 
You start in the Krita Yuga, you mess it up, you blow your one chance for happiness, you go down to the next one, or to the Dharpara, and you end up in the Kali Yuga. But it's not Kali forever. You don't go on suffering and killing and being evil. The whole of the Mahabharata, uh, uh, the Mahabharata War initiates the Kali Yuga. So the last books of the Mahabharata take place in the Kali Yuga, whereas the books before it have taken place in the third. The battle takes place in the third period. It's the after battle that takes place in the fourth period. And then, then we don't know. It ends, <laughs> but it begins again. So there is an end to karma. There's an end to karma in an individual life, which is you pay for your sins in heaven, in hell, and you're rewarded for your virtues in heaven, and then you start over again. So it is really a happy ending. It ends, in a sense, in the Golden Age, in the Kurta Yuga. Because at the end, you'll have that beginning. So that's the hope. The hope is that in the course of time, an individual will perfect herself so that she can enjoy heaven. And in the course of time, the human race will perfect its time so they can have another uh, Kali, uh, Krita Yuga, but it has to do that by descending into the moral hell of, of, the, of the Kali Yuga. So in a way, it's a helpful book. Um, it, it gives hope for individual salvation. It gives hope for the human race to be destroyed and recreated. I mean, after all, people die and then someone else is born. That's what happens. You get old, you die, and then someone has a baby. So that's what happens to the universe. <laughs> it gets old, it dies, and the universe is a baby again. Um, it's just the way life is as we see it. Cycle. <laughs> but the individual moral cycle is what the Mahabharata is so interested in. How people who have, um, for various reasons, even Yudhishthira made serious mistakes that they regret. Uh, even for them, there is hope at the end. That's why the last books are so important. That's the light at the end of the tunnel. Is the end, is the end of the book. So, uh, yeah. as you recommended, um, uh, the, there is no mention of rebirth um, in the last books. Uh, though there is a world beyond the hell and heaven. Yes. So, so what can we anticipate for these uh, characters? It says they go to a world beyond which there is nothing. But uh, in the interim period, they have to be born again. In the interim well, period, they have to be born again. Well, uh, whether, because no, I don't know whether when the world is created and there's another Kurta Yuga, whether there will be another Yudhishthira and Arjuna, I don't know. I don't think they'll be there when the universe is remade. I think this was their universe. <clears throat> They're in that mysterious place beyond which there is nothing, whatever it is, where they are very happy. <laughs> I don't know where it is. <laughs> Um, can I kind uh, of slightly digress. I uh, like, um, you know, yeah. this is such a maze, it's such a labyrinth. And uh, consider not only this, that you have uh, delved deep, deep into the Puranas and uh, what I mean, uh, so so many of uh, Sanskrit books that you have uh, translated also right from the Rig Veda and Manusmriti and uh, um, the Kama Sutra and a wide variety of uh, Sanskrit texts you have uh, gone through. I mean, all this requires um, degree of uh, proficiency, natural prof profound knowledge in Sanskrit, uh, which is not as currently a spoken language um, in major parts. So, uh, and you started learning Sanskrit at the age of 17. Can you throw some light on the pedagogy that you followed? How, how did you I mean, uh, to be able to be so proficient in such a language, uh, uh, what was it? I mean, how did you? Uh, get it? I'm not really proficient in Sanskrit. That is to say, a real Sanskritist. 
would be someone like my colleague, Gary Tubb, um, or Sheldon Pollock, is a person who knows how to read all different kinds of Sanskrit. Now, I am not um, a, a, a Rig Veda scholar. Years ago, I translated the Rig Veda, but I haven't worked in it for years. I'm not a Pandini scholar. I'm not good at reading grammatical texts. I'm not much of a philosopher. I don't read Vedantic texts. There are many different kinds of Sanskrit, and I'm not proficient at all of them. I always liked easy Sanskrit. <laughs> um, the Mahabharata, and also the Upanishads, really, the Mahabharata Puranas are the equivalent of um, cult literature in a way. Um, when I was at Harvard, my great professor, Daniel Ingalls, had me reading Kalidasa Kumara Sambha. I remember reading it as a young girl. I was 18. And it was lovely. And I I can read Kavya. Kavya is one of the Sanskrit forms I, I can read. Um, and um, I loved it. And he mentioned that the story of Shiva and Parvati and the birth of Skanda and all of that was also told in the Puranas, in the Shiva Purana, among others, the Skanda Purana. So I said, oh, that's interesting. Let me read those. So I went and read the Puranas. And I liked the way the Puranas told the story more than I liked the way that Kalidasa told the story. So I came back to my professor and I said, actually, I like reading the Puranas more than I liked reading Kalidasa. And that was like saying to a music specialist, you know, Mozart is OK, but I really like Elvis Presley best. So Ingalls was horrified that I liked the piranha. <laughs> Very bad. Truth is, okay. I do have plebeian tastes. I really do like. So most of my Sanskrit has been in the Mahabharata and the Puranas. So I have a limited range of all the things there are in Sanskrit. I can only read some of them, but but that, it covers enough. I can read a shloka, so I can read Manu. I can read. Kama Sutra was also hard. Kama Sutra was hard to translate. Kama Sutra is another difficult Sanskrit, and that I worked hard at. Um, and I uh, asked for help from Sanskritists that are better than me. So I, I'm not such a great linguist. What I am is a, a, a lover of stories. I am a storyteller. I, I love all, I never get tired of stories. How many variants there are. A 70, another version, another, read it again and again. This is a different way of telling it. And other people would say, well, you already know that story. Why don't you read a different story? I say, no, I, there's a different way of telling this story. This one tells it a little bit differently. <laughs> and I like the way they tell it that different. So I would um, collect together all the variants. And in the variants, you begin to see the personality of the storyteller and the regional differences. Some Puranas are from Bengal, some are from the South, and so forth. But that's what really kept me going all those years was all the different kinds of stories. And there are stories um, in Manu, there are stories. One of the books I did recently, um, Beyond Dharma, it was called and published in, is about the art of Shasta. That's hard Sanskrit too. So that, that kind of Sanskrit was hard for me to read art of Shastra. And actually the Kamas is very difficult Sanskrit. So those were hard for me. The Puranas Mahabharata, that I can always do. That's always just a, a pleasure. So. I'm working now actually on a book about the stories in the Mahabharata that have nothing to do with the Mahabharata. That is the stories that are told in the Shanti Parwan and the Anushasana Parwan, where Yudhishthira says, I need some money to do a sacrifice. How am I going to get money? And some Brahmin says to him, well, you can get the gold that Maruta left in the mountain. And Yudhishthira said, who was Maruta? And what gold did he leave in the mountain? And the Brahmin says, well, once upon a time, there was a king named Maruta. And then you have a long story, which has nothing to do with the Mahabharata. Nothing to do with it. But it's about a king and gold and all that kind of thing. And at the end of it, Yudhishthira says, oh, thanks very much, and he goes and gets the gold. But people always leave that out when they're telling the story of the Mahabharata because it's not about the Pandavas. Because the thread, it goes, yeah, to making the thread there, I have to, I think. Uh, yeah. well, there are about 150 of those stories in the um, Antiparvan and the Anishasana Parvati in particular. 
So I've collected all those stories, so I want to translate them and, and find out what their philosophy is, what kind of stories they are, where they come from, what, what they say, how you group them, their animal stories, their philosophical their myths, uh, stories about Indra and Virkha and the Thunderbolts. So, anyway, so I'm still working. This is my way of saying, even though I translated the end of the Mahabharata, the Mahabharata has not ended for me. I'm still working on the Mahabharata. <laughs> That's so wonderful to hear. <laughs> yeah, I will be looking forward to that. And again, um, uh, um, Dr. Donegar, as a translator, um, I just uh, like I would like to know: Are you uh, uh, are you an intuitive translator, or do you follow any specific theories, like uh, theories of translation or uh, uh, grammatical rules, or? Uh, uh, yeah, it's you go more by intuition. Uh, yes, I, I just I read the verse and I write what I think it means, and then I go over it more carefully, and I often look up words, even words I think I know what they mean, because words have so many meanings in Sanskrit. So you read it and it says, it seems to me that it says he became angry with his son and threw a pot at his head. So I write down. When I read it, he became angry, Akhrudaya. Then I think, what does the verb krud really mean? Does it mean anger? And I look it up in the dictionaries and I see the examples, and it's not always angry. Sometimes it means to lose your temper. Sometimes it means to make a moral judgment. And so maybe I will think about it a little more and then translate it differently. But my first instinct is just to look at the Sanskrit and write down what I think it means. And then afterwards, sometimes when I read the end of the story, it seems to have a different point and I go back and then I start looking more deeply at it. I usually don't read commentaries. I read commentaries when I get in trouble. So in the, a lot of, as you know, there are a lot of mistakes in the Mahabharata, a lot of false reading. And then I go down in the critical edition to see what the alternative readings are. And sometimes I look in Mila Kanta or the other commentaries to see what he thinks they are. But my first thing to do is just to read it and see what I think it means. But I don't publish that. I, I work on it more and I think about it more. Um, sometimes um, at the end of a whole big piece, I decide, well, for instance, for instance, Manu, um, I translated it as anger when I first came across it, which is one of the things it means. And as I worked through the text, I realized it needed, meant more than anger. So I went back and changed it. I said pride or proud yeah. anger, something like that. So as you get to know a text better, you see that it uses common words in a particular way. And then you go back to your early translations and change them. So I worked on it over and over. I do a fast first translation that no one ever gets to see, just to get an idea of what the story is about and so forth. And then I go back and uh, when I'm in real trouble, I asked some of my colleagues who are better Sanskritists. I asked usually Gary Tubb, um, and um, uh, he's well, he's my main go-to person. But there are other good Sanskritists at the University of Chicago and elsewhere. And I said, does this word really mean what I think it means? And sometimes they say, yeah, it does. And sometimes they say, no, no, no. Actually, it has another meaning. So there's always someone who knows more Sanskrit than I do. And when I'm in trouble, I call them. When I'm in Calm waters I sail on by myself. But when the storm blows up, then I, I carry on. I call on Gary Tubb or someone else. I said, did I get this right? Does it really mean this? <laughs> Sometimes the commentary can help. Exactly. Very often the commentary doesn't know any more than I know and makes something up which is wrong. Can you just say, he's just spinning yeah, his exactly. He doesn't get it either. Yeah, okay. In fact, I have, uh, I mean, I have noticed your intuitive insight in a couple, a couple of uh, instances where you, you, uh, you adopt a reading not even supported by the manuscripts. Okay. Like the uh, one uh, I recall is, um, I think in the Ashwabika Pava, yeah, uh, it is. Um, yes, Masma Shoke Manah Kashid Ishten. Kashi Dishtena Vyathate Manaha. So actually, the reading is Akashi Dishtena Vyathate Manaha. And 
uh, of course it doesn't fit at all and you have um, uh, you have re read it as um dishte na yathate manaha uh, which i think fits perfectly it which uh, uh, fit perfectly though there actually there has to be a uh, mistake by the scribe because it has to be akashi akashir dishte na vyathate manah there is very no r in between yeah. yes very yeah, often your uh, but when i find a verse untranslatable i go down to the critical edition and i see there's like five or six different ways that the manuscripts don't agree that they keep trying to fix it mm -hmm. sometimes i find a manuscript mm -hmm. fixed it the way i would have fixed it if i had been writing the text and i say i'm using that <laughs> sometimes i just say there's trouble in this verse no one knows how to do it my best guess is this and then of course there's the mahabharata itself uh, is aware of the grants there's the wonderful story about the also wanting to have the mahabharata and calling ganesha this is much later story this is not um a contemporaneous with the actual writing of mahabharata it's a great story and he says you must write down anything you don't understand and the guy says okay so whenever he sees that the scribe is getting ahead of him he throws in a grunt he throws in a knot he throws in a piece of sanskrit that doesn't make sense and so the scribe is writing and writing and the scribe says ah oh, what is that what is that and so he gets ahead of him and that's the way the <laughs> mahabharata tradition accounts for the fact that there are some mistakes there are some verses that don't make any sense and you have to do something to them to make them make sense and if i'm lucky one of the manuscript has made a change but if i'm not lucky i say i'm making this change there's one where i think such of a tea is present when she's not even in that verse at all it's another woman's name that belongs there it doesn't make any sense at all to have her there and i put the other woman in and i made a note that actually the text says it's the wrong woman but it can't be that woman it has to be this woman one that's the largest error i found in the last book that i just put the wrong wrong woman <clears throat> so sometimes you have to fix it yourself but if you're lucky you find a scribe who fixed it for you <laughs> professor can you explain um your predilection for uh, translating the uh, epithet hrishikesh as the spike head one um, i mean in contrast to the uh, you know uh, you, um, traditionally adopted one of the lord of the senses uh, after all it uh, refers to krishna who may be causing goosebumps in many but there is no cause for that equan a person of equanimity uh, mm -hmm. to have goosebumps goosebumps to the extent of having all his hair stand erect like that so <laughs> and you feel that that is more appropriate <laughs> so who knows what uh, who knows what what i always think of him as the kind of person who can never comb his hair down right no matter what he does it sticks up and i think uh, that's <laughs> this thing stands up on end like you're terrified or electrified it just means kind of hair that you can't quite get to lie down properly and i always thought that was an affection of it go up <laughs> you know i wrote in the I mean, why would it go up for krishna <laughs> why would it go up for krishna <laughs> or he causes your makes your hair stand on end when you see him that could be another meaning <laughs> i don't really know what uh, what some of them mean yeah it um, may stand for us if we comes he comes before us yeah whoa it's krishna uh, whoa we have some goose pimples i was thinking goose flesh. goose flesh is the um uh, uh, english hush, way hush roma hush then from, from oh, hush and no, so i suppose that rishika is yeah the, the uh, going to the etymology yeah that, the dictionary uh, word is gripolate no one says for gripolate um so i think goose flesh yeah. is 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 the is the normal english equivalent um or just the word thrill and sometimes mean thrill means a lot kesha hrishik kreshik esha i mean uh, that's the uh, traditional uh, way that we see it yeah. um hrishikas are the senses and he has lord of the lords over them has a control over them yeah uh, so 
that can be made. Of course, that's it. There's another doubt I had uh, about your um, rendering. I mean, uh, what do you um, uh, like? Um, like maybe we know of the Siddhas, the Vidyadharas, the Kinnaras. Couple yeah. of occasions, there's mention of Sadhyas. Sadhyas. I think in the Swarga Rohana, there is an instance in uh, Sadhya uh, Punya Karma Bhi. Uh, so, uh, of course, you have written the uh, original Sanskrit words uh, and uh, trans rendered it as uh, Sadhya with, uh, with uh, good deeds or good karma. Yeah. Uh, but um, I was wondering that the whole uh, verse reads as Devi Braj, like it's the it's a scene where Duryodhana is uh, in heaven, uh, surrounded by all the gods and uh, uh, you know all resplendent and all. So uh, it is Devi Brajishnu Sadhi Sahitam Punya Karma Bhi. So uh, doesn't it appear that it's like sadhya as uh, you know um, opposed to siddha uh, it is um, something to be attained or reached or someone to be reached like uh, through punya karma rather than uh, sadhyas uh, who have punya karma through punya karma you reach them uh, which could be an adjective of devai given the fact that they all, uh, the main char characters, they merge with the respective devas they have uh, connected to, like the Ashwins, uh, the Nakula and uh, the twins with the Ashwins and uh, uh, etc. Yeah. So uh, uh, I felt that, you know, uh, dramatically uh, that possibility is there. That's uh, uh, Devai, Devai um, Punya Karma Bhi Sadhyehi. People that can be reached if you by gods who have good karma. Good karma. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The thing is, they're already in heaven, right? So mm -hmm. nothing has to be done anymore. They're finished. Um, uh, the the dhya form means something which is to be done, which is about to be done or can be done. But they're done already. They're in heaven. They're at the end of their line. So there's nothing more to do once you get to them. They're there. So, so what are the sadhyas then? Uh, like we know of the siddhas who have yeah. attained uh, a certain level of maybe tapas and uh, yeah. Yeah. The sadhyas are, are to be attained. But they're there yeah. already. It doesn't make any sense because they're already at the goal. Uh, yeah. They have achieved their goal. Yeah. I don't they know. can only be the goal for others. They can be only the goals for others. That's right. Other people. <laughs> they can be. When you get to heaven, you can reach. Them. <laughs> um, uh, the names also occur sometimes because it puts the meter of the verse. I'm always conscious of the fact that although the shloka is a very loose verse form, it is a verse form. And there are times, I, I said in the preface, I believe in the arguments of the combined oral and written composition of the Mahabharata. And that many parts of the Mahabharata have been written down as they were dictated by oral poets making it as they came along. So I think sometimes words are inserted in a verse which don't really have a lot of meaning, but are simply the right word to fill the meter at that spot, particularly, but not only, at the end of the line. So when you're listing all the people in heaven, you might just put in the sages at one point because it has the metrical form you need at that point in the verse. I think some of the epithets are used that way too. When you're talking about Krishna, so if you have a certain metrical hole to fill, Hrishikesha fits it. And you're not really thinking of him as Hrishikesha. You're just thinking in the Krishna <laughs> at the end of a dactyl or dum da da dum and you need a da da dum And the da da dum is Hrishikesha. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the improvised verse form accounts for some of the looseness of the intellectual construction, especially of the epithets. I think that's where the epithets do a great deal. It's still in a verse for the poem. And he's not always saying, I want the listener 
at this point to think of Krishna as her Shikesha. He's just saying, I want you to think of Krishna and I have dum da da dum to fill and her Shikesha fills the verse. So, so I don't take the epithets perhaps as seriously as, as I might or as some people do. I think of them as the, the tools of a painter, the tools of an artist um, on his feet, thinking on it. <laughs> As I said in the preface, at one point I tried to leave them out. I thought they're not adding anything. I'll just say Krishna's led to Arjuna instead of saying Rishikesha has led to Arjuna, the left handed archer. But the verse was so dull and boring that way. It was so much more fun. <laughs> okay. okay, so you you wanted to add some spice to it. <laughs> so. I back in okay, that's good. I put back in the spice. I really Dr. Doniger, if. Uh, if you were to retell uh, any part, any portion, or any part of the story, uh, st I mean, the story of Mahabharata, like there have been many modern retellings. You have also listed a few, and in, in many vernaculars also there are, there are, and uh, even in Sanskrit we have this Urubhanga, which has Duryodhana as the hero rather than uh, the, and uh, in Malayalam we have. Uh, you know, uh, a very uh, like we have uh, Randa Muram, a very uh, renowned book uh, based on Bhima. So, uh, what character do you think you would like to uh, uh, retell or recast? I mean, it's a hypothetical question, maybe silly. Uh, I don't know whether. <laughs> yeah. I think the character that I identify with and find most interesting, of course, is Draupadi. Uh, I'd love to write a novel about Draupadi, but someone already did write a very good novel about Draupadi. It's um, um, The Palace of Illusion, uh, and that's a, a lovely story about Draupadi. Um, I, I would perhaps tell a different story about Draupadi, um, but I think she's wonderful. Um, and so um, that, that's, that's the character that I... She's so tough, and she yells at them so much. And she gets away with having five husbands. <laughs> House and, and the Bob Arter can't get used to that. They tell this story to explain why she has five hundred. They tell another story to explain why she has five hundred. And then of course, um, the, the enemies are always saying, "Well, what kind of a whore is she? He has five husbands and so forth." She yells at them. He talks about them. She says, "Where is your money? Where is your money?" She gets it. So um, I think Galvani uh, would certainly be um, someone I would, I would write a book about. Um, and then there's also. Another book I think has also been written about um, um, the future life of Amba when she becomes, she's reborn as a woman who masquerades as a man and is ultimately killed by Bhima. Um, that I think is another story about sexual transformation. Not a big story, it's a side story in the Mahabharata, but she is a major character and the whole idea of a woman who's rejected by her husband and then vows to be reborn as a man. But that's the story that I think I could write about and have, have, have a good time writing about. And I think, again, there are many uh, modern Indian novels based on the Mahabharata. I've only read some of them, and I think there is one about the Androjan, uh, the reborn Amba. Um, so, uh, the Mahabharata has said so much about these characters. We really don't need modern novels about them. There they already are. Um, uh, there's so much about them in the Mahabharata. So we can only imagine what would happen to them now. But as you say, Indian literature has been reimagining the Mahabharata for centuries in different dialects and so forth. Um, it would be, I think, uh, humorous of me uh, to say, well, here, I'm going to write my own version of the Mahabharata. I think the Mahabharata is just fine as it is, and I would rather go on reading it than trying to write my own version of it. I think all I can really do is translate it, which is what I, which is what I'm trying to do or going on to do. Okay, uh, Doctor Donegar, you have got such a. I mean, uh, you know, your uh, career is planning for half a century of teaching and writing and learning. Um, what what do you find? I mean, do you see any difference uh, in the uh, in the teaching arena and the learning methods, or how uh, the students uh, approach the subject uh, through the years, like 
from the time when you began as a 17 year old oh, and yes. uh, you might be you might have taught uh, at many levels undergraduate and then postgraduate and for uh, a doctoral level it's, it's uh, how uh, do you see uh, the approach to us the learning but first things got better when i came on the scene there were very few women there there are a few women uh, the teaching positions in universities um and so it was harder to get women students and so forth that improved in addition when i first began there were very few indian students in america and that improved more and more of our students were, were from india also in the beginning all you did was sanskrit they had no other indian languages and that improved, they started teaching Tamil at the University of Chicago in particular, and Telugu and Marathi and other universities um, in America. When I was at Oxford, there was only Sanskrit and now there are other Indian languages at Oxford and Cambridge. So women have come on the scene and that's an improvement. And other Indian languages have come on the scene and that's an improvement. And people have been asking better and interesting questions really about it. There was a time when the feminist questions began to be asked and so forth. And then I think some changes came which were not improvements, which were really a censoring of the text, um, this idea of that you need um, warnings, uh, trigger, trigger alerts, trigger warnings, that there are things you can't talk about in Sanskrit texts. That's a challenge for the worst. Um, there's also been the really destructive idea of of cultural appropriation, which would mean that I wouldn't be hired to teach in many places because I'm not Indian. And I think the whole idea that you can only learn about your own culture is so terrible and is so destructive of the whole principle of international understanding and interreligious understanding that I think it's a serious threat to the humanities and to the uh, the way that by learning other people's languages and religions, you not only learn something wonderful, which is much more interesting than your own language and religion, but that you understand the world in a different way. So right now, I think it's a good thing that I'm retired. I don't think I would be hired in many places uh, because I'm a white woman. Um, and um, I, not only would I resent that personally, since I think I should be allowed to teach uh, Sanskrit because I love it so, but I think it's just a bad thing for the world in general that there are these little ghettos of, of understanding that require um, where you were born and which, how you were grown up. So, so after many decades of real improvements, opening up the gates to other Indian languages, to other Indian people participating in, in the, 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 uh, the study of India in Europe and America, it's now closing down again. It's, it's a telling. Sure. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a telling. That's a telling observation. So well, it's, those I, are the changes I've seen. So I feel very lucky that I lived when I did, and taught when I did, and retired when I did. Um, right? Because of these changes that mostly happened since I retired in, in 2018. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I hope things will get better uh, again. I hope this is just a, a, a kind of an adolescence, an awkward growing period that the world is going through. There's always hope. There's <laughs> always hope. Okay. As professor of the history of religions, uh, who has dived deep into the subject, um, how would you compare the different complexities of popular faiths uh, with that of Hinduism? Do you see any meeting point? Well, Hindu is one of the many things that I have always loved about Hinduism is that um, there are infinite Hinduisms. I mean, um, as, as compared with Christianity and aspects of Judaism as well, and Islam, the three religions I know about, there's a central authority and you can disagree with it if you want to. Sometimes you get burnt at the stake for disagreeing with it, sometimes you don't. But there's the idea that there is a center and then there are people who have different ideas, which may or may not be tolerated, depending on how confident that center feels about its power structure. Hinduism doesn't exist as a single religion. 
The idea that all Hindus regard the Bhagavad Gita as their sacred, sacred text is completely wrong. Only a particular type of Hindu regards the Bhagavad Gita as his or her sacred text. Otherwise, people regard the Tamil Ramayana as their text or uh, other, uh, the, the text of the Tamil saints that my colleague A.K. Raman is in translated it. In the Maharashtra, they have Marathi texts. And in the villages, they have their own stories. So there is no single Hinduism. And the idea that there is, which is a political idea, which began in the beginning of the 20th century and is now being put forward by the present government, is just wrong. Hinduism is not like Christianity and Judaism and Islam in having a book, the religions of the book. It has a thousand books. So what I love about Hinduism is precisely that different Hindus regard different books as sacred and different gods as sacred. And um, it's always been possible to do that. Some forms of Hinduism have enormously been colored by Islam. Sufism is in all sorts of modern Hinduism. There are Sufi influences and, and they're Muslim influences. They're not in the Gita. They're, they came into India after the Gita was composed. So it's the richness of Hinduism, which I particularly love. There's always new stories coming in and so forth. And the idea that it's like the monotheistic religions of the book in the West so underestimates Hinduism and, and uh, desecrates really what is wonderful about it. So I worry about the, the political situation in India that makes people who don't know better in the West think that everybody reads the Bhagavad Gita and they're all like that. And the Muslims really don't belong in, Hindu, in India at all because they don't read the Bhagavad Gita. It's just madness. Um, and um, that too is something that I hope is a phase that the world is going through and that India will someday be restored to its former glory as a place where Jainism and Islam and 10,000 forms of Hinduism all thrive. In fact, there's a long tradition of allowing for discourse even in the philosophical systems. You first build the Purva Paksha or, uh, you know, the dissenters uh, view first yes. and then uh, academically um, thwart them. So there has always been room for dissenters and discussion and debates, uh, academic in nature. Like the Shankara Digvijaya. Where Shankara talks to the Buddhists, and then he talks to the Jains, and then he talks to them. Oh, that's that's a lot of fun. These are, of course, Shankara always wins in this text. But just the idea that there are even the Charvakas, and he talks to the Charvakas, and they have their point of view. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. So that's the India that I, that I love. Um, that's the India that I've mainly and, written about. And, uh, that's the India that I would like to see reassert itself someday uh, in uh, Bharatwarsha. So on that note, uh, Professor Doniger, I would thank you very much for uh, giving your valuable time for this you nice good questions. You asked such good questions. It was a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Namaste. Namaste. Okay, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs>